The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink, because you bear the name of Christ, will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. the one holy and living God. Amen. Amen. So I feel like the disciples have had a rough few weeks. Anybody remember two weeks ago, sweet Peter was, you know, answered the question right. He said, who do you think that I am? And he said, you're the Messiah. And then he told them all how he's going to die and they freak out. And, and Peter, you know, rebukes Jesus for saying these things. And, and Jesus is like, get behind me, Satan. You're thinking about earthly things, not heavenly things. And then last week, uh, they're arguing amongst themselves, the disciples, who, which one of us is the greatest? And, uh, Jesus sort of catches them after the fact, and they're all embarrassed, of course, as they should be probably. And he says, to be the greatest of all, you have to be the least of all. You have to be the servant of all. And then this week, well, they're just trying to, they're, they're just trying to get something right, aren't they? And so there they are, and they see somebody casting out demons in Jesus' name, but they're not part of the gang. They're not, they're not part of us. Stop. Stop. They try, they try to stop them, and then they want Jesus to be pleased with them, don't they? That we're, look, we're, we're, keeping it, we're keeping it clean, we're keeping it right in the family. And he says, no, don't stop them. Don't stop them. They're doing good things in our name. Anyone who's not against us is for us. And hasn't our culture sort of flipped that over for the most part? Don't we often say, if you're not for me, you're against me? But Jesus is saying, if they're, not, if they're not actively against us, if they're not working against us, they're for us. Let's be pleased with their actions because it's furthering the kingdom of God. And he goes on, he goes on to say, more so, if you get in the way of one of these little ones, it's going to be worse for you to go, to go jump off the pier with a millstone around your neck than to get in the way of these little ones. That's how serious it is that, that you let people express their faithfulness 
You know, he calls them the little ones. And, and it's all about people who are these young ones in their faith who are coming to experience faith. And it's not about going and saying, well, you're not doing it quite right. You're not doing it how we do it, so you're clearly doing it wrong, and you need to stop now. It brings to mind for me the fact that in, in, in Christianity, there's over 33,000 denominations. Did you know this? 33,000 Christian denominations in the world, probably because we at least 32,999 times said, eh, you're not doing that right. I'm going to take my marbles and go over here and do it the right way. It doesn't, doesn't shine the best light on us, although I think we can speak plainly about it because the Anglican Church, the Church of England, we're sort of one of the original breakaways. So, But it's, it's all Jesus calling us, asking us, to stop worrying about what those other people are doing and start focusing on ourselves. What are you doing to further the kingdom of God? What are you doing to help grow these little ones' faith? What are you doing to grow your faith? And so he goes on into this infamous passage, right? I heard the youth group was talking about it this morning and wondering what, what are they going to say about this, uh, <laughs> this whole cut it off, pluck it out thing that we have happening. So I hope I give you what you need, youth group. Uh, so metaphor, right? Clearly metaphor. Jesus is not saying go cut off your arms and legs if you, if you, if you screw up. Uh, but he is asking us to look at ourselves and understand what is it in us that causes us to stumble? What is it in the shadows of our souls, because that's really where that stumbling comes from, what what is it in us? Bad news, it's different for everyone. Good news, we all have something. So I kind of generally lump it into three categories of things. The things that happen in our shadowy parts that cause us to stumble. The stumbling is usually motivated in some way, in lots of different expressions of fear, fear of something or someone, shame, being ashamed or feeling like we're not enough or unworthy in some way, or vulnerability of some kind, that feeling of of being so uh, nearly exposed, something about us that we, that we just have a hard time living on that sharp edge of feelings. And so, so let, me, let me tell you about how that can kind of express itself, okay? So recently, a friend asked me to do something for her. And uh, we'd been talking about it for some time and trying to make it happen, and I assured her I would make it happen, and I failed. I couldn't do it. Lots of things conspired for that to happen. But when it came right down to it, I couldn't make it happen. And we were talking on the phone, and I said that that's what happened. And she was angry at me, Uh, angry at the situation. She knew there were other circumstances, but she was still angry. And so we hung up, and not in a good place. It was very frustrating for both of us. I knew, intellectually, that these things had been in the way, that, the, you know, that it wasn't just because I didn't care, it was because these things sort of conspired. But nonetheless, I knew that I had failed. So I hung up the phone, I was with my kids, we were out and about, and I, I in retrospect, can tell you, I, you know, I kind of started pushing the stroller a little bit faster. And then, <laughs> and then I, this little script started in my mind, this little conversation, this little retort started in my mind, like, you should understand all these things, all these reasons that this didn't work, and you should know, and, and I started getting really, you know, defensive, and, and we get back to the car, and the kids aren't moving fast enough, and I snap at them, come on, get in the car, get in the car, and I'm trying to get them buckled up, and they want to pick up all the toys on the, ba- on the floor of the van, and, and I'm rushing them along, and finally get them buckled, and I'm all furious and annoyed, and get in the car, and of course, every driver on the road is terrible at that moment. <laughs> We get home, I pull in the garage, and turn off the car, and there's just a moment of silence, which if you have kids, you know that moment of silence is rare. But 
I got that moment of silence, and somehow that just caused me this, this miraculous moment to just take a step back. And I went, oh, <laughs> oh. I went, I went from feeling really ashamed that I had failed my friend to really defensive about why that all happened, to really angry at the entire world around me because I had felt so vulnerable in my shame, in my failure. It happens just that fast. And, and it happens to any and all of us, right? Have you been there? Have you had those moments? Have you had the clarity then too to kind of be able to say, whoa, that's not, that's not who I wanted to be. That's not how I want this to go. But it's, it happens so quickly. And what I feel like Jesus is calling us to in this passage is to know what that was in us. What hooked us, you know? Father Jim and I often talk about it being hooks. You know, what hooked you that's pulling you down this kind of dark path? And how do you get unhooked from it so that you can see the big picture again? Jesus wants us to know and understand because it's those hooks that cause us to stumble. When we don't know what our triggers are, what the things are in us, in that shadowy part that, that cause us to feel fear or shame or vulnerability of some kind, then we're constantly hooked by them and they're just leading us around. But when we can take a step out of it, we have this incredible opportunity to to realize we're more than just the hooks. We're more than just whatever fear we're dealing with. And that best of all, we're all in it together. We're all, we're all subject to these moments and these feelings. Because the, the set of emotions is common to all of us. Uh, many of you know I, I study the work of Dr. Brene Brown, who's a sociologist and researcher at the University of Houston, and she studies these things, shame and vulnerability and fear, and, and, uh, and she puts it pretty, pretty seriously. Either you acknowledge that you have this whole set of emotions, she's been studying this 15 years, either you have this whole set of emotions, you acknowledge that, or essentially you acknowledge you're a sociopath with, <laughs> with no uh, ability to have human connection. <laughs> because we are all impacted by one another. It's, we, and it expresses differently for every single one of us, you know? It doesn't mean it has to be big, huge emotions or something, but we do feel them. We do feel them each in our own way. And our task is to honor that in each other, honor the common humanity of that experience in all of us, so that we can understand what it means to not be a stumbling block for someone else. Because it is when we're stumbling that we're being the stumbling block for somebody else. That's, that's how it works. That's why he talks about not just don't be a stumbling block, but realize what your stumbling blocks are. If your hand or your foot or your eye causes you to stumble, get, get it out of the way. And the way that we get those those things out of the way, those shadowy parts out of the way, is by understanding and acknowledging them. It's also about honoring them, uh, honoring that that is normal and it's okay, but it is about doing the work to know and understand what that is. And that, I think, uh, that's, I think, where this saltiness thing comes in for me. Uh, there's, there's a lot about salt in scripture, and salt can actually mean a lot of things. Salt can be about preservation. Salt can be about flavor. Salt can be about hospitality. I'm going to talk just a little bit about flavor. We're salted with fire. We're salted by fire, he says at the end of this passage today. And I, I read that to mean that these difficult parts of our lives are difficult parts of ourselves, that's fire to walk through, y'all. You have to learn and understand who you are. 
And sometimes that process of learning and understanding who you are can feel like walking through the fire. But that's what gives us our flavor. I bet any and all of us can look back at a time in our life when something hard happened, and now we look back at it and say, that was really defining for me. That really showed me who I was. That really changed my path. That really showed me who I want to become, right? We've all had those moments. The fire gives us that saltiness. We cannot deny walking through the fire because it's what makes us who we are. So Jesus doesn't expect that we will never stumble because we're all going to stumble. We're just, we're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. We can try and we do, but we're not. And so what does it mean to honor those fires, to honor that those difficult moments on your path made you who you are today, a good, holy, wonderful human being created in God's image? Can you give yourself that? Can you give yourself honor for, for your saltiness? Can you love and embrace that in yourself? It's, it's one of the great journeys of our life. And what I would wager is, when we understand that flavor that makes us who we are, when we understand the fires we've walked through, who've informed who we are, we, we get to breathe a little more because we're no longer living out of fear or trying to hide or trying to, to defend against something. We come to accept who it is we are that God made us to be. And that usually puts us in a far better position to not worry about what other people are doing, to not worry about them because we know they're on a journey too. It's not about them. It's about us. And knowing ourselves makes a lot more room for the other. And doesn't, don't we all need room? Don't we all need people to make room for us? So, so be at peace with one another. Come to that peace by knowing who you are, knowing where your stumbling blocks reside, and let that knowledge become a stepping stone instead of a stumbling block for you. Thanks be to God for the opportunity. Amen.